Numbers 26. Today I'm titling the message, Handling, Handing Over Leadership Well. Handing Over Leadership Well. You know, how do you replace a big name leader? You know, sometimes we see this as a problem amongst churches. When a church has grown to a, such a, a large site because they've had a very charismatic pastor, they've had a very strong leader, and all of a sudden it changes when... Uh, a new, they retire, they move off the scene, and life has revolved around their personality. And one of the things we should be learning, and some of the things that have been happening, we need to be careful of following celebrities and making celebrities out of men. We want to be word-based. That needs to be our everything. And just a second here. And with that... How do you replace a big name leader? Can anyone, can any of you name the prime minister of uh, England that followed Winston Churchill either of the times? I can't. But we know Winston Churchill, right? Um, can any of you think of when Truman, President Truman had to remove Douglas MacArthur from the Pacific, from Korea, because of some insubordination in which uh, he was quite vocal? I mean, he was a very large personality, yet um, can anybody think of the general that followed him? Maybe a few of you might, but most of us probably can't think. Yet, you know the name Douglas MacArthur. The time has come. Moses needs to be replaced. The next generation is coming on the scene. The first generation has all died off because of their unbelief. They would not trust God going into the land. And so God has uh, uh, let them live for the 40-year span of time. And throughout that time, there have been a lot of burials. Today, I want to challenge us with this. God wants His people... Uh, he wants his people led for the next generation of leadership. We need to be, if you would, leading and preparing. If you and I, our motto of this church is to develop faithful and fruitful followers of Jesus Christ. One of the problems in the modern day church is we are absorbers, consumers, but not duplicators. If you are not working at duplicating your faith in others, it is a deficient part of your discipleship concept. 2 Timothy 2.2 is key and essential that where we see four different generations teaching others to be faithful also. That has got to be key to our concept, if you would, of discipleship. And today I want you to look in your Bible. While we see the first generation has died off at this point, the second generation is ready to go into the promised land. They're ready for the conquest. Look, if you would, at chapter 26, verses 1 through 4. And it came to pass after the plague that the Lord spoke to Moses and Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and above by their father's houses, all who were able to go to war in Israel. So Moses and Eliezer the priest spoke with them in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho, saying, Take a census of the people from 20 years old and above, just as the Lord commanded Moses and the children of Israel who came up, I'm sorry, came out of the land of Egypt. We'll pause there. As we come into the scripture, we see that God, if you would, oops, I have my point up there. God's people are to be led to prepare by faith to follow through on God's promises. You and I, God wants us to follow through on what he has promised. He wants us to act by faith on what he has promised in scripture. As we think about what God has uh, done, if you would, we, you might be asking the question, I thought, hey, there, you said a census here, Pastor. Isn't that what the Bible says? I thought God was against censuses with David. What's the difference in when General Joab goes to King David and says, hey, you can't take a census, you shouldn't do this, God forbid, don't do it, King. Why was, the, what's the difference there versus here? There's a, there's a few differences. One, 
Joab told King David, God forbid, basically, that we would trust our arm of strength. When David confessed his sins to God, he was realizing he was wanting to see how great he was. It's just kind of like when Nebuchadnezzar says, is this not great Babylon which I have built? He was full of himself. The difference here in Numbers 26, one, the first generation has died off. The second generation is ready to come in. There has been a total change up of the, de of, if you would, of the population of the tribes. In fact, some tribes like Simeon, who was sinning quite heavily with Balaam's trick of going after all the foreign girls, if you would, and worship that we saw in our last message, they suffered a loss of like 22, 23,000. They're, they're, I mean, their tribe shrunk back quite a bit. When we see the changes, if you would, in the demographics of the people, God is doing something here for their allotment. I want you to turn over to verse 52. Can you turn there for verse 52? Chapter 26, verse 52, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, To these the land shall be divided as an inheritance according to the number of the names. To the large tribe you shall give a larger inheritance, and to the small tribe you shall give a smaller inheritance. Each shall be given its inheritance according to those who were numbered of them. But the Lord shall, the land shall be divided by lot, and they shall inherit according to the names of the tribes of their fathers, according to the lot of their inheritance, and shall be divided between the larger and the smaller. That makes sense, doesn't it? God was against pride of... David and did not want Israel later in history. They already have their land allotments. They didn't need a census for this purpose. The purpose of this is, if you would, it's kind of an electoral college. You know, you divide up the allotment of land and, and size and population centers and how you just determine that. Here we've got a situation where, hey, if you're a huge tribe, you're going to need a large plot of ground. Depending on this, the nature of the ground, if you're up north, it's rich, it's lush, where Dan was. There's all kinds of green vegetation, rich farmland, lots of water. If you're down in Judah in the south, huge area because it takes a lot more acres to support the amount of people. And uh, as you kind of run that in the picture, you see how God is allotting the census was for allotting the future land in the conquest. So this is about the tribal inheritance. God is going to make good in providing for his people. If I could take a second and review the whole book, if I could give you in three simple concepts, the book of number, numbers, it would be this. The first 10 chapters are organization. They're getting organized to go into the land. Unfortunately, chapters uh, 11 through 25 are disorganization. What's happening? They live in rebellion. They murmured and complained against the Lord. And that was repeated through that whole first generation for 38 years through the, the, the wilderness, if you would. And that is taking place. The last 10 chapters... 26 through 36 is reorganization. The census, they're reorganizing. They're getting set up to go in the land because this is an entire new generation. They were 20 and under or not even born when they first entered into the wilderness, left Egypt. And where they, when their parents, their forefathers refused to believe God to go into the land of Canaan, to take it as the promised land, as a, as a possession that they were to have. So, back in verse 2 and 3, you see that there's an aspect where all those who are military age, this is organize, organizing militaries, probably to some degree, and definitely a allotment of the land. I would see those as the two main things. Again, it's not vanity or pride. It's organization. Could you imagine if all of us who are older than 20, and that would eliminate well, since we sent all the kids to junior church, that would eliminate all but, oh, what about five, six of you? <laughs> um, that uh, the rest of us are in trouble. I guess there's more, about eight, ten of you. Um, and we, the rest of us are toast. 
But the little guys in here and the t young teenagers and young, uh, young adults, they would have to uh, organize the next generation. You've got to put together military. You've got to be able to organize the land. You've got to be, you are the new adults because we're all gone. Could you imagine that? That's quite a shift. Ronnie's smiling. But um, anyhow, there's a big shift going on. Well, next, I want us to think in not only these land allotments, but it, I want to just mention how that the, God has multiplied the people immensely. The, the first census was 603,000 fighting men. The second census is 601,000. Now, if you were in mathematical terms, you'd say that would be a zero net gain. You, you, you had a 3% loss or so. I don't know that it's 3%, but you've had a, a, a percentage that was lost there. But think about it this. They're all young. And the abnormal death rate of those who are the older generation, God has truly multiplied them just like he promised to do in the beginning of Exodus when the slave drivers and Pharaoh was trying to kill all their babies. God abnormally blessed them. And, and you're just like, Lord, you truly have promised, you kept your promise to Israel here, what you said back in Genesis 12, that you're going to, their seed, you're going to multiply their seed and they're going to be like the seashore. Isn't this kind of staggering? Just think numerically, God, you've done an awesome thing here. Well, for those of you who are not into numbers, let's move on. Uh, parents, at times, do you make empty threats to your kids? Like, if you don't brush your teeth and do this, this, and this, I'm going to, and you give some crazy empty threat that you'd be thrown in jail for if you actually were to do something like that. Those are just braggadocious threats that you make. Does God make empty threats? Look in your Bibles, verse 64 through 65. And we see here, but among these there was not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron and the priest when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said to them, they shall surely die in the wilderness. So there was not, not left a man of them except Caleb, the son of Jephuthah, and Joshua, the son of Nun. That is staggering. How many, how many fighting men was there? 603,000. Just men. That's, and only two are left. That's a staggering loss, if you would. Did God keep his promise? Yeah. He's like, because they refused to believe him. Now, was that cruel of God? How are you going to set up a nation of people that are scared to death to trust you? won't believe you. You've opened the Red Sea for them. You've, you've led them against out of captivity, slavery, brutality. He's fed you every single day and you're so schizophrenic that you won't believe God. What kind of nation would the first generation have created in Israel? It would have been a mess. And God says, I've got to remove faith to make a holy people for me that will be a serious nation that is going to truly be holy, set apart unto me. Well, we move on. And a second point here I would like to bring to our attention is what God pronounces as judgment is not an empty threat. Uh, we just touched on those verses. Only two are left. Caleb and Joshua. Joshua is going to be one of the men that we've seen go up partway on the mountain when Moses went to receive the Ten Commandments at one point. As you remember, that was a long period of time that Moses was up on the mountain, came up and down the mountain, and one of those times we know of where Joshua was there. Joshua has fought before. Um, Caleb and he were the two tri uh, spies that believed the Lord, encouraged the people of God, hey, you got to believe God, but the people weren't into it. Well, next, I want you to turn to chapter 27, would you please? Chapter 27, verse 1, then came the daughters of Zelophad, the sons of Hefer, the sons of Gilead, the sons of Machur, the sons of Manasseh, from the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph, and these were the names of the daughters 
Malah, Noah, Hagla, Milka, and Terza. And they stood before Moses, before Eleazar the priest, and before the leaders and all the congregation by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he would not, uh, he was not in the company of those who were gathered together against the Lord in the company that with Korah. But he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be removed from among the family? Because he had no son. Give us possession among our, our father's brothers. So Moses brought their case before the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zephahad speak these... So, I'm sorry, they speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of the inheritance among their father's brothers and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. And if he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the closest re relatives closest to him in his family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be to the children of Israel a statue of judgment, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So in this passage, you've got five ladies. Did you know that the son, the, sorry, the daughters, there are no sons, the daughters of this hard to pronounce name, Zelophad, he has five daughters. Their last names all have a uh on the end, which has a reference to Jehovah God, Yahweh. And they, these five individual ladies come up four times in Scripture. Did you know that? They come up in chapter 36 of this book. And we know their names. Now think about this with me. Do you know the, the name of the lady who was uh, the woman at the well? I don't know if we do. Do you know the name of the woman caught in adultery in chapter 8 of John? We know her story. We love how God forgave her. Do you know her name? No, we don't know her name. I mean, you could go, the list goes on of ladies. Lot's wife. What's Lot's wife? Uh, you might say salt block, but that's not the right answer. We don't know her name. Um, and here, we've got four times in Scripture, the five daughters. You know what God has done here? He's elevated these five ladies who have been, if you would, left out of the inheritance. And they're dividing up the allotment of land. They're figuring out family, if you would, the family farm that you're going to get and the allotment you're going to have for the next 1,500, 1,600 years from this point. And they're like, our name's going to be lost. Our, there will be no inheritance to our people. And our father had no sons. Was this an oversight on God's part? Like, man, God just forgot the woman again. Was that the case? I don't think so. Yes, there were 613 laws. You know, sometimes God allows us to stumble into things to enhance his grace in the situation. God allows us to stumble into things, to enhance His grace so that we see how good and kind He is. The world would say, look at God forgot the women. He's such a chauvinist. And they see evil maligning things like that. Is that the case? What does God say here? Give them an inheritance. Is there any reservation with God? No. This is an opportunity to glorify Him. It, it draws focus to the ladies. No other religion B biblical Judaism of the past and biblical Christianity has elevated women above other cultures. You look at Yemen today where you're not allowed or multiple different countries around the world where you're not allowed to go to school, be educated, um, all kinds of horrible, evil things that are done to women. And I'm not even going to say them as you know things that happen in the Islamic countries. Just degrading things. But what has God done? You go to pagan countries. And, uh, you know, like the movie Itao, that the, what the stranger uh, was based off the missionary work there to the, in Papua New Guinea. What happened there? Before they came, 
that when a man died, you killed the woman. Is that a biblical concept? What did our Christian missionaries, did you know that for thousands of years, Christians have been liberating, if you would, women from that kind of evil, demonic thing? What did the Egyptians do? The Egyptians also, you would kill the different females of the house so that they would be buried along with them so they have them in the afterlife. Is that not a messed up, warped view of life? Satan has always been the author of death, guys. He loves death. That's why this abortion stuff is such a major issue. He loves to kill, steal, and destroy. Is that not in your Bible? That's what he does. That's what he loves. That's what he propagates. And we need to be ones that are sensitive to, uh, the, to, to respecting those who are made in the image of God. It's more than the sanctity of life, guys. These are image bearers for whom Christ died. It, it's higher than just life being sancti uh, sanctity. The sanctity only exists because they were made in the image of God, designed to know Him. And Satan's like, I want to kill them so they never have any opportunity to glorify him. Meanwhile, men suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And God gives them over to a debased mind. And to chase all kinds of debased things. You can check that out. Romans 1.18 through the end of the chapter. Today, as we move into our, our next clip of Scripture is this. God receives, appeals, and ensures his people's inheritance. You know, you five daughters of Zephalahab, you are, I'm going to honor you. I want you to have an inheritance. You asked, you appealed, and God delights in this. No, no problems, no reservations here. Interesting, the inheritance may pass not only to sons, but also where circumstances dictate, verse 8, to daughters, where there are no sons. And to brothers of the deceased, verse 9. And to uncles of the deceased, verse 10. Or to the nearest living relative. The solution that God gave here was, in this case, there, uh, this was to be taken care of by giving these ladies an inheritance. Well, we move on to our, our fourth point is this. God commissions qualified pastoral leaders to guide his people. Now, by pastoral, I don't mean the New Testament church of pastor. I mean shepherd. The concept of a shepherd is going to strongly come out here. Would you look in your Bible, chapter 27 and verse 12. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go up into this Mount Arium and see the land which I have given to the children of Israel. And when you have seen it, you shall be gathered to your people as Aaron your brother was gathered. For in the wilderness of Zin, during the strife of the congregation, you rebelled against my command to hollow me at the waters before their eyes. There are the waters of Meribah at Kadesh and the wilderness of Zin. Then... Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, who may go out before them and go in before them, who may lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like the sheep which have no shepherd. And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is a spirit, and lay your hand on him, set him before Eliezer, the priest and before all the congregation and inaugurate him in their sight and you shall give some of your authority to him and that the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient he shall stand before Eliezer the priest and shall inquire before the Lord for him by the judgment of the Urim at his word they shall go out and at his word they shall come in and all the children of Israel with them, all the congregation. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eliezer, the priest, and before the congregation, and he laid his hands on him and inaugurated him, just as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. 
So we come into our, our passage here, and we see in verse 12, right off, uh, something that's important. And uh, our first point is this, God honorably disciplines disobedient leaders. So in verses 12 to 14, they, they've all died off of the first generation, if you would. And uh, they come up to Mount Nebo. It's part of the Arium Mountains. This is about 2,600 feet. It's one of the highest points. This is in modern-day Jordan. And I've been there. You can see pictures of it. There's actually, when you look up pictures, you'll see kind of like... Um, the Catholic Church has kind of built chapels on top of anything that's historic. And uh, from the, where that is, they'd be right very close, if not the very place where Moses was, a high point. And you can see Jerusalem from there. And I mean, Jerusalem's, a, I mean, a long ways away. You could see Jericho. You could look into multiple, I think you could see Hazar from there. I'm not positive. But multiple points into the land that they're going to conquer very soon. And Moses got to peak into the land from top of Mount Nebo. But here, that's not the point of this passage. Um, with this, we see that in chapter 27, we see it comes up to this point, and uh, my command to hollow me at the waters before their eyes, they didn't do that. They were part of the rebellion, right? They just, they didn't follow the Lord, they followed rebellion, and uh, unfortunately, they, uh, they're in sin and they, they die prematurely. Verse 13, um, Moses, it's time for you to come home. In verse 13, as, as he shares there, don't you love how God talks about death? It's totally different than our world. Verse 13, and when you have seen it, you shall be gathered to your people as Aaron, your brother, was gathered. Do you remember that language back in Numbers 20? It's the same language. That Aaron's time to come home. It's time for you to be gathered to your people. Isn't that a beautiful... Christians, the church is not a building. What is the church? The churches are gathering together, amen? And it, it's not uh, liturgy, it's not style, it's a family that is covenanted together, that's saved with a credible profession of faith, that are bonded together. And when you look here, the language of the Old Testament Israel... The saints gather together when they pass away. That's why the psalmist can say, Psalm 116, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. And God's like, I love it when we get to unite. Isn't that sweet? It's not the world's picture. Do we believe that heaven is better than this? So much of the time we get wrapped up in the separation, the agony, the pain that is real. But we grieve. That's real pain. We grieve with hope. That's the difference between how we sorrow and how the world sorrows. And that's from 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Well, as we consider these things, we, you might even ask him, man, it's a bummer Moses never got to go in the land. Did you know that there's a sense where Moses did get to have a peek in, from inside the land. Do you mount, remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Who was on top of the mountain? Deep into Israel. Do you remember when Peter asked the question, when is this, what's the sign of your coming and what will it be like and, and uh, what will the kingdom be like? And all of a sudden, God lights up the top of the mountain with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus in their glorified state. Do you know what Jesus brought attention to? It wasn't buildings. It wasn't temples. It was the day when your salvation is complete and you're glorified. Isn't that an awesome thought to think about? And as we, we treasure that, that's what the kingdom will be like. That's what, um, when he comes back, that's why the scripture can say at the rapture, 1 John 3, 2, when he comes back, we shall be like him and we shall see him as he is. In our humanity, can we just look right into the face of God with our sinfulness? Moses was veiled from it. Yet God in his glory says, I'm going to make you glorious. This mortal shall not only put on immortality, 
this corrupt will not, not only will put on incorruption, but it will be raised in glory. Is that what 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 through the end, 57, 58, that whole passage tells us, you are sown in corruption, but you're going to be raised in glory. Right now, you're like the first Adam, but the second Adam, you're going to be raised in his glorious stature. And that's just an awesome thing to think about. Well, moving on with uh, our B. God seeks leaders who are active shepherds. This is neat because Moses comes and he's like, God, uh, would you... I'm, he's burdened because Moses has been a good shepherd. And Moses speaks to God, verse 15. Verse 16, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation. This is like a prayer. Remember, I've mentioned that Moses is a guy in the Old Testament... The guy with a flat nose, he's always on his face praying to God. And he comes to God. So God has just told Moses, you're going to die. Do you see Moses like, I don't want to die. Do you see him pitying? Like, and none of us look forward to death, guys. I mean, it, there's an aspect where it is part of the curse. We understand that. But do you see him wallowing in self-pity here? No. Moses turns to God in verse 15. God, your people have got to be shepherded. It's important that believers be incorporated in a shepherding relationship. And he's like, God, this people needs a shepherd. God, would you give them a shepherd? And he goes in verse 17. This is for the sake of the congregation, the assembly, the mass of assembly there. Two and a half million people probably. 601,000 men alone. Plus you have women and children and that even breaks down all that. We've got other numbers there. But uh, in verse 17, who may go out before him? This man, the shepherd. Go out before them. Go in before them. Who may lead them out and bring them in. That the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. God's like, people need good direction. Now, he didn't say that you can't think. He didn't say that you need to be robots. I do not want you to be clones of me. I want you to be clones of Christ. That's the goal. You've got to be Christ-like. Follow me where I follow Christ, not where I don't. And that's, that's not me trying to say, well, just don't, okay, I can do everything bad and you can't. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm a sin-flawed individual. Don't follow me there because I'm not Christ. I'm not, the, don't make that, me like that celebrity personality that we mentioned earlier. I'm just, I just have an open Bible and we get to go into it together because that's what matters, isn't it? That's what we want. Follow me where I exemplify Christ, Hebrews 13, not anywhere else. You follow as I authoritatively teach the Word of God. The Word of God is the final authority, not Pastor Woodford. So we uh, get into the Word. All right, so with verse 17... Um, you know, this is a it just if you cross reference, we won't go there. But in First Kings three seven, it's neat that young Solomon, King Solomon, when he was going to take over the kingdom, do you know what he prayed? The Nazb renders it this: I do not know how to come out or to go in. Solomon knew his Bible. He's like God. I I need justice. I need wisdom so I might that I might do justice with this people. God, they're going, to be, they're going to need a wise judge that can lead them where they need to go and make good decisions. And that's really important. It was neat yesterday as I went to the young people at, at the camp. And we, as we studied, what is biblical masculinity and biblical womanhood? What does the Bible say about this? In a world that attacks those things where people don't even know. I, I said, here's one of the lies that we need to think about. You were not assigned your gender at birth. That's one of the world's sneaky ways of saying things. Your gender was established at conception. You're either XX or you're XY. And I got to talk with the kids, and the kids get to ask tons of questions of me and Sean South and numerous other guys that are there and, and, and godly um, 
ladies and uh, some of the wives that came along and that helped minister to those young people. We want to interact with them so your questions are heard, but we go to the scriptures and think through these things. So like iron that sharpens iron, we, we go to the scripture, we figure out answers. Well, we go on in uh, verse 18. Take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man whom is the spirit. Now, this word spirit here, we don't know if it's referring to the Holy Spirit or to his spirit. So depending on your translation, it's a little bit isolated. But you know what's fair to say? We know that all of the leaders of the Old Testament had a theocratic anointment, anointing where the Holy Spirit helped them. Do you remember where David says, take not your Holy Spirit from me? You and I never have to pray that. You know why? Because where we're going to go in Ephesians for communion is that you are sealed by the Holy Spirit. You know what's cool about that? You have a tamper-proof salvation. How cool is that? He's like, I am the seal and the guarantee of your salvation until Jesus comes back. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. We'll get there after the message. But in verse 18, we see that the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man whom is the Spirit. And lay your hand on him, set him be before Eliezer the priest and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give him some of your authority to him, and all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. Well, as we look in our text here, one of the things that you and I need to keep in mind is God commissions obedient men. Joshua is known for being a godly man, a distinct man. He's a man who has a conscience, a man that um, he follows God. He relays God's word to his people. I mean, I love the book of Joshua. And chapter 1 just really, really shows how he was a faithful and godly man. What kind of spirit does Joshua have? Well, if we had more time, you would see in Deuteronomy 34, 9, which I wrote in your note, I put in your notes, he had the spirit of wisdom. And uh, in Joshua 1, 7 and 9, it says that, that he, was, he had strength and he, had, he was courageous. That would characterize his character. Um, and the Bible says that in whose heart, speaking of Joshua, has melted away in fear, has no spirit. The ones who are just eaten up with fears, they have no spirit, no sense of courage that is spoken of in chapter 1. As I think about this, when we go on to, and lay your hands on him. Now, when Moses put his hands on him, was there some kind of mystical connection that took over, like he's handing over some energies and powers into him? No, that's just mystical garbage from cartoons. Beware of that kind of thinking. Beware of these positive energy things that are going on these days. Some of it is just flat out demonic, and we can talk more about that if you'd like to. But... The laying on the hands is nothing more than a visible recognition of God's calling on Joshua. When you as a church ordained me into the gospel ministry, you questioned me, you observed me for two whole years, and then you had, we called sister churches, just to see if I was a heretic or not, and if my philosophy of ministry was just some rogue weirdo that was coming into your church, or if, if I aligned with like-minded, solid churches. And we had 14 different messengers from churches across Iowa, and I think even uh, Wisconsin, and, and not, maybe not Wisconsin, Wisconsin, definitely Michigan, uh, there was someone, one or two there, Pastor Hoff came out and others, and you guys as a church laid hands on me and said, we recognize the call of God, your testimony of salvation, your call into ministry, your doctrine, your philosophy follows what we see in the Bible. And you laid hands on, was, did you give me any power that day? I'm a superhero now. No, you didn't. You, what you did was you say, we're recognizing what God has done, what God has called. 
Well, uh, next we think about this. God uses his people to recognize God's call of leaders. Verse 19 through 20. Um, we, we've just gone through some of that, but uh, he goes before Eliezer the priest, and God symbolically uses the high priest, Eliezer, to be present there. And uh, this shows a, he's a man. Not only is he mentioned, but the Urim is mentioned. Do you remember in the high priest, uh, they were allowed to seek the Lord, and they had the Urim and the Thurim that was in the breastplate, and they were cast before, and the lot was cast, but the answer was, in, was from God. Remember? As that took place, it was a reminder to the people that God is in control and that they could sovereignly seek Him and that He would provide. Well, with all this, I want to bring to some applications for you. How can you promote faith in God's promises? So those around you are anticipating God to do what He promises to do. The children of Israel believed God. They're following through. The second generation's going into the land because they're acting by faith. They're preparing an inheritance because they believe God's going to give them that when they go in to fight their enemies. That's faith, guys. That's acting on the promises of God. Next. Is there someone you should be shepherding or caring for? Are you duplicating your faith, sharpening other believers? That is an important thing that we need to be doing as disciples. Do you accept God's no's by faith? When Moses is told, you can't go into the land, and Moses takes the next step of faith, okay, God, we need a good shepherd. God, would you give someone that can really lead these people in and out where they need to go and how they should go? Moses did not wallow in self-pity when God disciplined him. Well, with those things, let's uh, pause for prayer. If so. Father, we thank you so much for this time of worship that we've been able to have. Help us to be found faithful to you, loving you and desiring you, for you are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen.